So how are we doing? Is the consolidation accounting beginning to make more sense? If not, I've got some good news for you. In this lesson, we're going to repeat the previous lesson with only one slight change, and that is we're now going to see what happens when the parent corporation uses the cost method of accounting for its investment in the subsidiary. So with that in mind, let's get started. In this module, we will use the same facts as we presented in the previous lesson for the acquisition of GECO. And just as a quick review, a deal was reached and a transaction closed on January 2nd of year 1. And under the terms of the acquisition, Parent Corporation purchased 80% of the outstanding shares of GECO for $4,120,000. At the time of acquisition, GECO held patents with a 10-year remaining life and had recently issued bonds at par maturing in 10 years. Now Bob was attracted to the business because of its steady cash flows and low risk. The business has consistently delivered $200,000 of net income each year and is expected to continue to do so in the near future. And if you remember, the acquisition of GECO looked like this. Parent Corporation acquired 80% of GECO shares and Parent Corporation now holds GECO shares as a majority controlled subsidiary with a 20% non-controlling interest held by the previous shareholders. Parent Corporation now has to consolidate GECO in preparing its annual financial statements to comply with GAAP. So far, there's been no differences in what we've discussed in the previous lesson. At the date of acquisition, GECO had assets and liabilities as reflected in this table. The first column summarizes the book value of GECO's assets and liabilities, and the second column summarizes the fair values. Of note, the inventory had a fair value in excess of book value uh, by $200,000. The fair value of the patents was higher than book value by $500,000. And the recently issued bonds had a fair value in excess of book value by $300,000. Do you remember why that might have occurred? That's right. Presumably because interest rates had dropped and the 10% was a more attractive coupon than it was at the time of the bond issuance. Once again, nothing has changed in how we go about preparing the purchase price discrepancy schedule. You start with the cost to acquire the 80% block, and then you determine the implied value of the 100% of equity. We compare this against the existing book value of the equity recorded in GECO at the time of acquisition to determine the purchase price discrepancy of $659,000. The purchase price discrepancy then gets allocated to the identifiable assets and liabilities of GECO that have fair values different than book values. In this case, the inventory, patents, and bonds payable, leaving a residual of $250,000 that represents goodwill. The non-controlling interest is valued on the same basis as Parent Corporation paid for its majority stake as no market information is otherwise available. And thus, the opening non-controlling interest equates to $1,030,000. This schedule too is the same. The excess fair value increments for the inventory and patents will reverse as depicted here. The bonds payable had a fair value in excess of carry value at the date of acquisition, which will be amortized over the life of the bonds using the effective interest rate method. Goodwill is not amortized, however it is subject to an annual impairment test and we've made some assumptions around some impairment charges in years one and three. As a reminder, keep the ending balances of the unamortized purchase price discrepancy in mind as these will factor into the consolidated balance sheet. So far, nothing has changed. However, when you look at the financial statements, the non-consolidated financials are slightly different than what we saw in the previous module. So let us review the draft three-year statements for each of Parent Corporation and GECO. And the only differences of note from what we previously discussed were number one, the investment in GECO is still being carried on the non-consolidated books of Parent Corporation at the acquisition cost of $4,120,000. Instead of reporting investment income relating to the equity pickup, Parent Corporation is reporting dividend income from GECO of $80,000. There were no other dividends paid in prior years. And because Parent Corporation's investment account and net income have not been adjusted for the equity pickup items. The golden rules that we talked about previously of the consolidated retained earnings and the consolidated income 
equaling the parent corporation retained earnings and, and income no longer applies. Using the cost method of accounting requires us to separately calculate what these numbers should be. So let's start with these. First, let's start with calculating consolidated net income. We begin by recalculating parent corporation's income on a standalone basis. That is without any earnings included from GCO, investment, operating, or otherwise. To determine this amount, we can begin with parent corporation's reported earnings, the $420,000, and reverse any items, in this case, the dividend income received from GCO of $80,000 from income. So on a standalone basis, parent corporation was able to earn $340,000 in year three. Now we have to figure out how much of GCO's earnings get added back to parent corporation's earnings to come up with the consolidated income. We return to our equity method principles and our purchase price discrepancy schedules. GCO earned $200,000 in year three, which needs to be offset by the amortization of the items pertaining to the acquisition costs namely the patent, bond payable, and goodwill impairments amounting to $32,500. The net of these amounts represents the net income of GCO based on the acquisition value of three years ago. Of the $167,500, PICO will be allocated 80% or $134,000. The other 20% gets allocated to the non-controlling interest. Next, let's determine what our consolidated retained earnings should be at the end of year three. Use of the cost method for the past three years hasn't helped us in tracking consolidated retained earnings. That is, the day of the acquisition and start there. So let's look at GCO's current retained earnings balance and subtract the balance at the date of acquisition. This would give us all the equity pickups we had missed. Note that the dividends would have been recorded already in PICO's retained earnings. So there is no need to worry about adjusting for those. We are only interested in determining the amount of undistributed earnings still residing within GCO. Then we go to our purchase price discrepancy schedule and tabulate the income related charges and adjustments during the first three years. There were $245,000 of charges in year one, $28,000 in year two, and $32,500 in year three totaling $297,500, which means that since acquisition, the equity pickup for GCO earnings was $302,500, 80% of which belongs to Para Corporation with the other 20% belonging to the non-controlling interest. Adding the additional $242,000 to PICO's retained earnings will give us the consolidated retained earnings. Our calculation of non-controlling interest uses the same valuation basis as the parent. We take the shareholder's equity of GCO as reported by the legal entity and adjust it for the remaining unamortized purchase price discrepancy arising from the acquisition costs. And 20% of this amount represents the non-controlling interest amount that would be reported in the shareholder's equity section of the consolidated balance sheet. We can prove this calculation by recalculating the non-controlling interest using the equity method. Both methods should leave us in the same position. Let's pull this together in a worksheet to see the consolidation in action. PICO and GCO are both reported on a non-consolidated basis. Our first step is to eliminate the accounts we know that will disappear as we move to a full consolidation. And those will include the parent's investment account of $4,120,000 the subsidiary common stock of $2 million, the subsidiary's retained earnings of $3.1 million. Next, we have to apply the purchase price discrepancy schedule to adjust the assets and liabilities of GCO to reflect the acquisition. The patents get bumped up in value by $350,000. Goodwill, not previously recorded until the acquisition by PICO, has a remaining value after the impairment charges during the three years subsequent of $212,500. And the bond payable is adjusted for the remaining unamortized premium of $210,000. Third, we have to fix the retained earnings and adjust it by $242,000 to what it would have been otherwise had we used the equity method to account for our investment in GCO. Finally, we need to set up a non-controlling interest, which notionally represents the 20% claim that the non-PICO shareholders have in the net assets of GCO.
Turning our attention to the income statement, you'll notice that many of the line items, such as the sales, cost of sales, are simply added together to form the consolidated balance. However, like the balance sheet, the consolidation requires similar adjustments. First, dividend income needs to be eliminated as these are simply transactions between PICO and GECO and had no impact on the consolidated entity as a whole. Second, we need to adjust the revenue and expense items for the amortization of the purchase price discrepancy. These adjustments include the $50,000 to patent amortization, the $12,500 to the goodwill impairment charge, and $30,000 reduction to interest expense for the amortization of the bond premium. And finally, because GECO and the purchase price discrepancy results have been brought into the consolidated income statement at 100%, we need to separately allocate 20% of the consolidated net income to the non-controlling interest, which amounts to $33,500. Once again, we are left with the consolidated net income of $474,000, which is what we'd expect it to be based on our previous analysis in the last lesson. It is more of a practical matter than the accounting standards which drive the decision as to which method of investment accounting is used on the non-consolidated basis. As GAAP requires consolidation of subsidiaries, the method of accounting leading up to that consolidation can vary. So on the one hand, the equity method has the inherent advantage of being easier to reconcile with consolidated income. In the absence of fair value information, one might argue that it is a better representation of the value of the investment than having made no adjustments at all. But as we all know, value is a fickle thing. On the other hand, the cost method certainly is practically speaking easier to do during the monthly accounting process. Keeping the financial reporting on a cash basis is somewhat easier for the non-accountants to understand. However, offsetting this advantage is the requirement to maintain offline reconciliations which are necessary for the consolidation at each reporting date. And finally, we have already mentioned that the cash basis but also the tax basis of shares most often aligns to the cost accounting method. And this also helps keep the tax perspective top of mind. So the bottom line is that regardless of the accounting method chosen, the consolidation results are going to be exactly the same whether you use the cost method or the equity method. That's all for this lesson. So until next time, don't stop till you get to the top. When you get to the top, don't stop.